Okay, so good morning, everyone. Afternoon, if you're on the East Coast with us over here. This is Casey. And I'm Hillary. And we're logging in from Pittsburgh to host today's webinar. We're really excited about today's episode. We have a special guest that we'll introduce in just a moment. But today, uh, we are going to be talking a lot about change management. And if you were here um, a couple of weeks ago, then you'll know that this is actually part of a two-part series on making continuous feedback um, happen in 2020. So we know that continuous feedback has been around for a few years now, but people are still kind of wrapping their hands around how to, how to actually activate it within their organizations. So during part one, we talked about what is continuous feedback and how best to capture it. Part two, which is today's episode, is where we're going to talk through a lot of change management. So say you want to make continuous feedback happen in 2020, we're going to talk about how do we gain buy-in from our leadership? How do we gain buy-in from our employees that we're actually going to be rolling it out across? Um, and then, you know, how can I use this change management for other initiatives that we want to launch? So we're really excited about today's episode. Yeah. I've had the opportunity to work side by side with uh, my own CEOs to influence change within organizations. And I know it's not exactly uh, a light lift, so this That's is right. very important to me. It can be a big hurdle emotionally and, and you know, from a cognitive perspective. So I have my chamomile tea. What kind of tea are you drinking? Development. Oh, the talent <laughs> development tea. So I think we're ready to roll. Um, so your host for today, I'm Casey. I'm over at Rapid Analytics. We're um, an employee feedback platform. Of course, we think that employee feedback can do a lot more than, it, than it's given credit for typically. So that's where I'm from. Yeah, I'm Hillary Wilson. I'm uh, in charge of business development here at Rapid Analytics. Uh, and I'm about to celebrate my calendar year here. So it's a really exciting time and uh, look forward to discussing this more. Yeah, that's awesome. And then we have Katie Gian Turco on the line. She's dialing in from uh, Total Wine and More. So Katie, why don't you say hi to everybody? Hi, I'm so excited to be here. As Casey said, I do talent and organizational development program management at Total Wine. So very excited to be joining you today. Thanks for having me. I'm so glad you're with us. Um, Katie's really going to be taking us through the nuts and bolts of change management today. So we're really excited to have her on the line. So we wanted to offer a quick recap of part one. I mean, we're just going to spend a few seconds introducing you to some of the main slides from the earlier episode back in November. Yeah, so last week we talked about what is continuous employee feedback. It's as simple as a continuous feedback strategy that encourages consistent communication that's centered around an employee's growth. So it leverages the trial and error learning patterns that we remember from childhood. Don't touch the stove, it's hot. Um, <laughs> then that's the way the humans naturally learn. That's right. Your mom doesn't tell you not to touch the stove six months after you've touched the stove. She tells you <laughs> not to touch the stove as you're about to do it. So it's a little more up to date, right? Um, so how does continuous feedback compare to some of the more the mainstays in the area? So for instance, annual reviews, uh, pulse surveys, we know those, those have been around for decades. And really the idea is that you can think of them in two separate buckets. Annuals and pulse surveys can be more of an event centric. They're driven primarily by maybe you rolled out a new initiative lately and you're trying to get that employee pulse on how the rollout has been. Or you're having an annual review just because it's been 365 days since the last one and it's time to do it and that's just how it is. With continuous feedback, it's happening all the time. It's maybe weekly. Um, some folks do it monthly. So there's more data points and it's more of an overtime measurement um, so that you can tell a better people story. Um, and we also talked about last time why your participation rate is so low. So a lot of us, at some point or another, we've received that email from HR like, hey, if we can get your department's participation rate on this pulse survey up to 80%, you guys get a pizza party. Right, I think we've all kind of received that email in one way or another. And it's because we're having to bribe people into engaging. Um, and really it's because of this anxiety that we talked about right here in this slide. So all these reasons that people are anxious about annual reviews, even pulse surveys to an extent. And we talked about uh, specifically what's in it for me. And the reality is for the hours that people spend putting together a good solid annual review, um, they're just not getting it back. They're not getting, they're not receiving any benefits at the same level of input that they put into it. 
Yeah, and as a recap, what we talked about in the last one was about getting enough data points together for storytelling. And the reason why storytelling is even important is part of change management is winning the hearts and minds of the people around you. And the best way to do it, again, we're very human centric, is through telling really solid stories. And they're ongoing. They're not just annual stories that you can warm the hearts for, you know, 15 to 20 minutes. They're continuing stories that you can tell through the organization and through different business units as well. And that's right. And as the subject of employee experience really gains a lot of traction, I know it's been a buzzword at some of the conferences you've attended this year, um, and even on the social platforms where everybody's talking about employee experience a little more than employee engagement, we're thinking, if you're monitoring engagement throughout a person's life cycle, then you can tell how a brand new hire from three weeks ago is feeling versus one of your mainstays, one of your veterans that's been here for 10, 15, 20 years. And you're not, again, only getting that one data point once a year. Yeah, I know in the future we're going to talk about influencer networks, uh, and that's also where that comes into play. Yeah. So uh, in the last webinar, we offered a guide of how to capture continuous feedback. And this is just a couple of questions that you can ask yourself before you even begin change. Uh, we want you to have a really deep and introspective look at what's going on in your organization and why you feel like it's necessary. Uh, so this is something that we will include in the next uh, email. So you'll get this along with the deck. That's right. And I think it feeds really nicely into some of the pieces that Katie's going to talk about because this kind of gears you up thinking through some of these questions. It gears you up for one of those exercises like the stakeholder map, which is something that we're going to get into where you're thinking, you know, okay, maybe my data security guy is really going to want to know does the platform follow data security protocols that he's comfortable with, he or she is comfortable with. Um, so it kind of gets you on that road to thinking through a stakeholder map, which we'll talk about shortly. So here we are at part two, how to transition to a culture of continuous feedback. And again, we are going to keep it roughly framed around the idea of continuous feedback in 2020, but these are true change management basics that you can bring with you to any new HR initiative that you want to tackle in the coming year. So Katie, I'm going to pass the mic right over to you and let you get started. Perfect, sounds good. I'm going to share my screen here. All right, and let's jump in. So let's start talking about continuous feedback and what is change management? I know our audience today, we've got a lot of people who maybe are new to change management or, or intermediate stage and are really starting to learn a little bit more about what change management is and how they can utilize it effectively in their role. So just to level set, change management is a collective term that we use for all approaches to prepare, support, and help individuals, teams, and organizations in making organizational change. And organizational change is really any large shift in processes, procedures, culture, changing the way that you do things at your organization, or rolling out a new initiative. I think the foundation of change management is really making sure that you do four things right. And I'm gonna talk through um, a couple of different examples of frameworks in a minute that are put together by reputable industry sources. But this one actually comes from my own experience. So you're getting some OC here today first time that I'm sharing outside of my teams and my organizations. Um, and this is just um, four pillars that really have emerged through my career um, in HR and change management. So the first one I want to talk to you about today is communication. Through any good change management plan, it's important that you communicate clearly and frequently with all audiences. And we're going to talk in a minute about who your stakeholders are and how to identify them and the different things that they want. Um, you also get a bonus C in communication here, which is being clear and consistent, right? So we want to make sure, if we can, that the message we're communicating throughout the change management plan is consistent over time and to different audiences. And that'll do a lot to preserve your credibility as somebody who's owning and driving that change. The second C here is cascading. So for large-scale organizational change management, which is what we're focusing on in this conversation. It's really important to gain buy-in as you go from your leadership down. So you wanna cascade information where you can, top to bottom, gaining buy-in along the way. 
Then consideration. So consider how others will feel about changes and how they're likely to react. Be conscientious of other perspectives. And this is one that I learned the hard way because as an HR practitioner, a lot of times things come naturally to us in the HR world. They make sense. We understand why we're transitioning to a culture of continuous feedback. Not everybody does. Um, and this is something that, that I learned the hard way through, a, through an initiative early on in my career where I didn't think and put myself in other people's shoes necessarily about what was their reaction going to be to the change. And this is where your stakeholder map is going to really help you out, understanding what those other perspectives are and really having sympathy and understanding for diverse perspectives and how different people are going to react to the change that you're driving. Then the fourth C on here is culture. So continue um, to consider the cultural impact of your change both before, during, and after the change. There might be um, certain processes or policies or procedures that you have in place that are going to need to change as a result of the project that you're driving forward. What will need to be updated? Can you change things proactively? Do things need to change afterwards? What cultural shifts have to happen to support the change? So that's your four pillars. If you do these four things throughout the process, you're going to be in good shape. But let's get a little bit deeper and talk about that stakeholder map that I told you we were going to talk about. So for those of you who are not familiar with stakeholder mapping, stakeholder mapping is a process of identifying the key stakeholders of a project or people who are invested in one way or another in the outcome of your project. Stakeholders can be categorized um, broadly according to different engagement levels, um, and the result is depicted usually on a chart or a map. This is one way to do it, right, is this stakeholder map here. But if you Google, if you don't like this one, there are dozens of stakeholder maps which can help you understand who your stakeholders are and visualize their investment in the project. Stakeholders can be anybody, right? They can be internal or external. They can be senior. They can be junior. They can be individuals or they could be groups of people in your organization. They could be powerful and have a lot of influence, or they could not be powerful in your organization. Um, they could be champions of your project. They could be detractors. But either way, you've got the opportunity to capture their role here through this stakeholder map and really do a thorough analysis of what's their perspective going to be, focus on that C, that consideration and understanding their perspective, and then moving through how you're going to convince them and address any concerns that they might have. So Katie, that sounds great, but how am I supposed to start having that conversation? Great question, and here's where we're going to lean on one of those expert models that I told you about. So Manzel Communications has put together this great model called SkipHab, and it's a methodology to use to begin a conversation when you are leading a meeting, leading a project, or in this case, um, proposing a change and change management solution. So the S is, situation, you're supposed to express the current state for discussion. The S here in this model should really be factual. So you want to state what you know about your listener's circumstances, and it should be relevant to the discussion. Current state of their business, technology, industry, the facts and the situation should not be controversial, should not be new to your listeners, and this should always be where you start by teeing up the situation. Next step is the C, that's complications. So you want to summarize the critical issues, challenges, or opportunities you're facing that are impacting the situation. Often this will provide new thought-provoking information for your audience. I, you want to go ahead and identify the critical issues that are impacting the situation and creating new problems or opportunities, provide insight into the consequences that will result if the complications are not addressed. Then P, sorry, <laughs> then P, you want to state clearly and confidently your opinion about what needs to be done to solve your listener's problem. So you note your opinion on the changes that should be made. This is you taking a position and proposing your solution. This is a high level. This isn't the tactical action plan and action steps. That's next. This is your high level pitch of here's the solution that we landed on, here's what I'm recommending that we do to resolve this complication um, and, and really create a resolution that's great for all of our stakeholders. A is that action. That's where you help your listener understand 
what are their expectations? What do you expect them to do to help you reach this solution? What is your ask? Are you asking for a budget to implement a new solution? Are you asking for them to speak to their direct reports about a plan that you want to implement? Are you asking for their feedback right now? Are you asking for them to take something away and do it as homework? This is your ask and the action item that you're asking for them to take away from your meeting. Things to consider, discuss, explore, and understand. Then lastly, your B here, you want to conclude how the position and action sections address the complications by tying it to a benefit. So how are your recommendations going to address your listeners' needs? And this is where you can reference back to that stakeholder map to understand what are everybody's perspectives, what do they want to gain, what are they concerned about, how does that complication impact them, and how can I show them that my proposed solution, my position, is going to address this and be a benefit for them in the long run. So skip tab. Let's say you've used this model, right? You've won buy-in from your senior leadership team. You've won buy-in maybe from your key cultural influencers, and you're ready to move forward. What's the process that you should use to enact this change? Excuse me, I had to clear my throat. The next part is implementing the organizational change. So you should use the ADCAR model here. The ADCAR model is going to help you implement organizational change. First is A, awareness. So you want to bring awareness to the change, communicate to people what's happening before it's happening, explain your reasoning and current pain points, give opportunities and employee to an opportunity to ask questions and make suggestions. Then is desire. You want to get them excited about the change. Gauge their reactions, identify your champions, and really help address people who are resistant to the change. K is knowledge. Provide training for them, coaching to explain to people what is it that's changing, how do you need to change it, address any skill gaps that you see, and offer resources to help support the change. A is ability. So before you leap in, both feet in, you want to make sure that you give people an opportunity to understand and practice how the change is going to work. So maybe if you're implementing a system, this is using the test environment to make sure that things are running smoothly. Maybe it is allowing managers to practice having conversations about the change with you or with the HRBP before they go out and actually speak to their team members. It's setting reasonable goals and metrics and adjusting processes so that when you actually do hit the ground running, it's good to go. Then reinforcement, this happens as your change is rolling out and afterwards. This is the culture piece that we were talking about earlier with the four C's. How can you do an effective job moving forward with the change and ensuring that your systems support the change now and into the future? The goal is to really get into the engagement zone where people are excited about the change, they accept the change, and the change is part of the culture of the organization. But we know that unfortunately sometimes people are not excited about changes, right? We could know that the change is the best thing for the organization. We have the data to back it up. We've gotten the buy-in of the senior leadership team and you still have some naysayers who maybe are not excited about the change like you wish they were. So how do you deal with that? What happens when you get to the D of that ad car model, the desire, and the desire is not there? You've got people who are not on board with the change. How do you navigate the naysayers? There are usually um, four main categories where we can see these people fall. And the first one is disorientation. So they are asking, where do I fit in? The second is disenchantment. Isn't it awful? The third is disidentification. I used to be somebody. This change takes away my agency. And the fourth is disengagement. Well, I'll just quit and I'll stay which we don't want, right? That's the opposite of most of our goals when we're making changes in HR. So we've got to assess what is the loss that people are feeling and then understand how do we address the loss as HR leaders. Here's your answer, right? Depending on what, half, what the loss is, you're going to react to it differently. If they're disoriented, you need to reorient them. You need to clarify the direction, make sure people understand their goals and their roles in the project. 
Then if they're disenchanted, you need to empathize and guide them, understand the reason behind the anger, listen to venting, focus on the cause, help them through it. A lot of times people who are in this disenchantment phase really just don't thoroughly understand. And a lot of times what this means is that you maybe haven't done the best job communicating. Um, what we did in my, one of my past lives when I led L&D at Guest Services Inc. is we actually did pilot focus groups with people who we knew were likely to fall into this category specifically because what it meant was it gave us an opportunity to empathize, to show that consideration, that C, and understand where they were coming from, the reason behind their upset, and listen to their venting, help them through it. And odds are if one person in your organization is it has a specific viewpoint here. There are others who also share that viewpoint, and you have an opportunity to do a better job communicating about the change to help eliminate that negative emotion that those people are feeling. The next is disidentification. I used to be somebody. So you want to energize and help them identify with the future by creating a sense of opportunity. Disengagement, you want to connect and help them understand the connection between their own value contribution and the organization's ability to succeed. There are three stories that you can tell. You can say that you're in crisis. Oh, can we survive the change? You can say, oh, we're changing again. Or you can lead from the third story, which is what is our potential? And for you to tell the most successful change management story, you really need to talk about potential. How good can we get? This is an opportunity. We're looking to execute more effectively. This is about growth, sustainability, collaboration reaching the full potential of what we can possibly be. And when you do that well, your highly engaged talent stays. So to lead from story three, we've got some tips here for you on things that you can do, action items you can take, really it's around communicating, being clear with your message, providing an opportunity for feedback, reinforcing positive thinking about the change, sharing your perspective as a leader around the change opportunity, share that B from Skipab, talk about the benefits, and go forward in the context of opportunity and optimism. And I'm gonna go ahead and uh, send it back over to you, Casey, after our crash course in uh, change management, back to you. All right, and we are just picking up where we left off. All right, that was great, Katie. Um, I think we were both kind of shaking our heads yes when you were talking about that focus group for the navigating yes. naysayers. I think that um, you know a lot of times we forget that we should just do dry runs with our fellow teammates. If you can't put together a full-on focus group, then maybe at least bring one or two folks in and say, hey, I want you to actually disagree with me and present reasons why you don't think this is a great change so that I can practice. So absolutely, dry run um, would be great in that instance. And what we wanted to do here is for the folks on the line who are looking to apply these change management basics into a continuous feedback rollout, we painted, we pulled together kind of a starter uh, stakeholder map for you um, and filled in just a few of the pieces of a situation that you might run into. So for instance, if that top row was maybe a brand new data analyst that you have on your, on your people team, some of the things that that person's going to be thinking about. Um, for the second row, this could be your CFO. They're going to want to know what are the dollar signs behind this yeah. new initiative that you're trying to roll out. The third would be the CEO. Is this going to help me reach my 2020 strategic objectives? Right. Do they care about EBITDA? Do they care about strategic initiatives? Are they a culture forward type of person that want that alignment? Yeah. You know, like speak their language and yeah. make sure that aligns with uh, their type of communication. That's exactly right. So if you know that, if you know there's one to three or even more, hopefully not too many, uh, goals, specific goals that your company has for the new year, put this initiative into that language so that these words, it's, it's becoming second nature for them as well. And so finally, the takeaways. These first three here just go back to all of the great knowledge that Katie just shared around the four C's, 
SkiPab and ADCAR, and we talked a lot about the D portion of that ADCAR and navigating naysayers. So um, just going back through some of those tools and models that she just walked us all through can really get your juices flowing for your change management in initiatives. I think finally, though, we're just wrapping it all up into the fourth takeaway, which is painting a very clear picture, mm -hmm. making sure that you're painting a clear vision and also checking the box of what's in it for me. If you're sitting in the CFO seat and you're watching your presentation on the screen, is it speaking to you? If you're sitting in the CEO seat, is it speaking to you? You know, so really putting on those different hats in separate ways and making sure that your strategic uh, conversation is hitting all the boxes for all the different stakeholders. Yeah, and I think that when Katie was talking about navigating the naysayers, really being prepared for any objections that will come your way and having already mitigated that before going into it. Yeah, that'll help with confidence in the first place. Yeah, nobody likes surprises. So Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so what's next for you? Yeah, uh, we would encourage you to keep up the momentum. So put together a stakeholder map for yourself for the next big rollout uh, by this Friday. It is the end of the year. It's a great opportunity to start fresh. Everyone's looking forward to the next decade. Um, Katie recommended a few publications. I know that I'm going to read next. Uh, ADCAR, a model for change in the business government, at, uh, excuse me, in business, government, and uh, our, uh, our community. This is why commas are important. Um, <laughs> and I'm going to send this in the recap. Uh, compare some of our features here at Rabbit to some of those of the other continuous feedback platforms. Some may fit what you need, some may not. Uh, and then also download uh, the uh, one cheater that we're going to send over just to peruse through it. And again, so then that way you have a really solid handle. You're going to get the stakeholder map, the deck, uh, the list of questions, and a few other little goodies uh, in that little toolkit. And then last, you can just shoot us an email. We're yeah. here to help. If you're ready to do, we're ready to help you. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think that was it for today. Thank you so much, Katie, for joining us. My pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. And we'll see you all on the next episode in 2020. Yeah.